Jean-Guy Nestad and Patrick Westfeld uh, are going to present an integrated approach for combining measured and synthetic sound speed profiles in multi-beam ray tracing. Um, Jean-Guy holds an engineering degree from McGill University in Canada and a graduate diploma in GIS from the University of Quebec, Montreal. From 2007 to 2013, he worked for CIDCO, where he gained most of his experience in hydrographic surveying. He then moved to Northern Germany, where he completed a graduate degree in hydrography at the Hafen City University Hamburg, recognized as a FIG IHO Cat A educational program. Since 2016, Jean Guy has been employed by BSH, the Federal Maritime and Hydrographic Agency of Germany in the section Geodetic Hydrographic Techniques and Systems. His current tasks include research and development, technical support on multi-beam issues, and hydrographic teaching. Welcome, Jean Guy. And then uh, Dr. Paul uh, Patrick Westfeld graduated as a geodesist in 2000 from, uh, 2005 from TU Dresden in Germany. He conducted research in the fields of photogrammetry and laser scanning and completed his PhD in 2012 on geomatic stochastic modeling and motion analysis. Since 2017, Dr. Westfeld heads the R&D section, Geodetic Hydrographic Tra uh, Techniques and Systems at BSH, the Federal Maritime and Hydrographic, Hydrographic Agency of Germany. The activities of his section range from conceptual issues pertaining to hydroacoustic and imaging sensor technologies, sensor integration and modeling, algorithmic development up to application specific imp implementation and practical transfer in the production environment. Well, good morning and welcome Jean Guy and Patrick. Uh, thank you for uh, uh, providing this presentation uh, and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, uh, listening to it and seeing it and I'm gonna hand it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, John. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yeah, perfect. Um, so, bonjour à tous. Uh, thank you very much uh, for attending. Um, um, I have to start this presentation by just mentioning briefly um, what the BSH does, what it, it what what is its mandate, and uh, especially where it um, conducts most most of its operate of its operations. Uh, and this is going to help us uh, understand the, the context of this project. So the BSH um, is um, the Maritime uh, Authority of the Federal Republic of Germany. It's thus responsible for the production of official nautical charts and other relevant nautical publications. To this end, it conducts its own multi-beam and single beam surveys using five dedicated ships and several um, smaller survey launches. Um, now its territorial waters comprise uh, parts of the Southern Baltic Sea and the North Sea. Um, together, they form an area of about um, 50,000 square kilometers. So it's roughly one sixth of the uh, German land area. Now, of course, compared to Canadian standards, this is a, a fairly a fairly small area. But there's some interesting facts about these um, areas. Um, when we talk about the North Sea, for example, the North Sea has a very um, dynamic seabed uh, requiring certain areas um, to be resurveyed at a frequency of at least um, once a year. In comparison, the, the Baltic Sea has a much more complex um, oceanography. Um, this is partially due to, the, to its semi-enclosed nature and also to the occasional inflows of um, North Sea waters uh, that have a much higher uh, salinity content as the um, Baltic Sea. And this combination uh, I'm sorry, and um, this uh, this combination is also um, uh, together with the fact that uh, the both of these, um, both the North Sea and the uh, Baltic Sea, are very shallow. Um, the uh, deepest point in the exclusive economic zone of Germany is about 70 meters, and the average depth uh, in the area is about uh, 20 meters. So together with this shallow environment, we have um, uh, a peculiarity, and this is the fact that there's a, a lot of shipping. The density of traffic in the area is, is, very, is very high. Uh, and it's this, this combination of shallow water environment with dense marine traffic that requires uh, quite a tight control over um, depth, measure, depth measurement uncertainties. And as 
in many other uh, hydrographic and surveying organizations and companies, well, often, not always, but often, uh, one of the greatest contributors uh, of uncertainty uh, in the depth, depth measurements is the sound speed uncertainty. And in this case, BSH is no exception. Uh, indeed, our, our multi-beam data in the Baltic Sea uh, is often affected by this beam angle dependent systematic error, uh, which we've assumed up to now to be caused by uh, basically an undersampling of the water column. In other words, we have too few sound speed profiles at our disposal to correctly account for the uh, actual path that was followed by the multi-beam acoustic uh, rays. Uh, and of course, this results in systematic errors on the multi-beam uh, depth measurements, and they're illustrated here. Uh, and many of you probably know them as uh, with their informal names of smiley and frowny, or what is also seen in the literature is this categorization as type, type 4 error. So what are common approaches to deal with uh, refraction problems? Um, well, of course, um, one of the easiest solution is to, to survey more densely. Um, and for that reason, uh, underwater um, systems or measurement systems um, uh, that sample the water column um, continuously were developed. And here you have two examples on the left of, of such systems. Um, and, and they provide then uh, higher density data. Uh, on the data processing side, uh, what's, av what's available um, is, well, first of all, you can accept data as it is if you have no other choice. Uh, but one common method which has been used uh, for a long time is simply to try to bend the seabed by changing the sound speed profiles and then retracing. But this is a very error prone method. It's very time consuming and it's not, it's not very effective. Um, more recently, and I mentioned two, uh, two other possible solutions, and one that was implemented in the software Chimera, I believe, um, is the idea to minimize a cost function on um, the, the overlaps between, uh, um, um, between, on, on the, uh, between um, parallel running lines. Um, that's one approach. Another approach is uh, not on parallel lines, but rather on cross lines. Uh, this is an approach if you have a, a functional model of how the depth error changes uh, with the sound speed profile error, uh, then using that functional model and uh, you can use the least square estimator to try to estimate um, what is the sound speed error in those areas. Um, yep. Um, so the question is, so why bother? Uh, um, and in fact, our, our surveys uh, do uh, comply with IHO requirements, uh, at least for the well, for the production of um, nautical charts and, and publications. And um, this, the cartoon on the left side of the slide, actually, uh, well, portrays pretty well uh, one of the reasons why um, there are in the Baltic area, the Baltic Sea is, is fairly small, but there are a lot of stakeholders that provide some kind of services or run some operations in the Baltic Sea. Um, and this, of course, puts a, a high demand in terms of uh, accuracy, reliability and up to dateness uh, for our survey data. Um, in essence, we, we provide um, hydrospatial base data for a variety of, of purposes, not only for uh, chart production. Uh, another parallel reason is that um, given the shallow waters of the Baltic Sea and the, uh, um, and the, and the many stakeholders, um, there are uh, many, many underwater obstructions, including wrecks that, um, that need to be detected, uh, that are detected, of course, but that need, there are others that, are, that have yet to be detected uh, and they need to be uh, monitored properly. So it's important to have um, you good and accurate data for that purpose. So as we set up uh, or as we started um, this, this project, we had um, a vision of what a, a, a ideally well-known water column would look like. Um, and this is, I'll illustrate that uh, simply with these diagrams here. Um, um, you have on the upper left um, um, uh, plot, uh, simply the, um, the survey lines of a regular survey with the position of um, some sound speed profiles that were taken. They are usually, well, we try at least to distribute them well in time and space. So this is here the spatial distribution. And on the 
bottom, the bottom plot shows actually uh, a, is a time time series plot uh, where you see the time at which the sound speed profile was taken. And of course, there's a lot of gaps because the um, there were only um, yeah seven profiles in total taken. Um, so with an underway system, then the um, the, the picture becomes a bit um, clearer. Uh, you have, of course, more samples at your disposal, and you can start to see, to have an idea of how the uh, sound speed uh, structure in the water column has changed in, in time and in space. Um, and now if you combine then uh, these uh, observations with uh, synthetically derived data, then you can try to fit in or fill in uh, the gaps between uh, those uh, measured profiles. And this is basically the idea uh, behind this project. Um, of course, um, here I mentioned the steps, uh, uh, one normal sampling on the left and then uh, sampling with, the, uh, with, the, with an underway system in, in, the, in the middle. Uh, but of course, there's uh, no counterindication that says that you cannot go directly from, uh, um, a, um, from a normal survey, let's say, with a few uh, sound speed profiles and, and go directly to uh, with, and combine those observations with um, the synthetically derived data and, and still have a pretty good uh, picture of the water column. If, of course, the um, um, sound speed um, uh, profiles that you measured are, are well distributed and representative of the, um, um, of, uh, at least partially representative of the, the structure of the of water column. Um, I, I have one slide about the, um, the project approach. So how did we approach this project? Um, we approached it also from a survey side and from a data processing side. Um, from a survey side, we, we realized that we, we need to, to have um, a higher density of data uh, um, uh, for, to, to complete this project. And so we uh, did acquire um, two years ago, I believe, uh, uh, an underway um, profiling system um, to um, provide uh, higher density data. So that was, um, uh, and we are in the process of evaluating and, and, and using that system in, uh, in our day-to-day -day operations. But of course, uh, we only have one of those systems and we have uh, five um, um, survey ships, let's say. Uh, and for now, it's still important to be able to use the traditional uh, method of taking sound speed profile measurements uh, and, and trying to apply um, the, outcomes of, uh, the outcome of this project of combining um, observations, so sound speed profile measurements with a synthetically derived uh, sound speed profiles. So on the data processing side, um, we needed to develop for this project then um, uh, tools to actually analyze our sound speed profiles and try to see if we can estimate um, or at least draw the portrait of what is the sound speed structure um, in the water column for those survey days. We needed then uh, the core of the project is actually to try to then uh, have this integrated approach to depth determination by, by combining um, uh, real measurements with uh, synthetically derived measurements, which come out of uh, two different sources, which I'll explain in a minute, either a hydrodynamic model or through interpolation. And finally, the last part, which um, consists in, well, after you've done that, you've, you've processed data with both um, uh, real measurements and synthetic measurements, then can you analyze the residuals on depth measurement overlaps using one technique um, or several techniques? And we're, I'm not going to talk about this part because we're, uh, we've been partnering with CITCO um, for, uh, for exactly for this part. And the next speaker will be presenting uh, what um, the, uh, the ideas behind uh, uh, this part um, uh, of this project. And uh, this is still an ongoing process. Um, of course, in any project, there are some, some assumptions that you have to put forth, and, and, and this is no uh, exception here. And uh, we um, have, or we have considered uh, in this uh, project that the, the undersampling of the water column is the biggest contributor of sound speed uncertainty uh, in our data sets. And from this assumption, then um, there are a couple of um, uh, points that are um, important to mention. Uh, one of them is that we are exclusively dealing with flat array design antennas, uh, which means that we have uh, a known sound, sound speed at the transducer at, at all times, where, um, a sound speed value which is used for um, beam steering. And we consider uh, at the present that there are um, no beam steering errors um, and that uh, um, 
and we're focusing exclusively on the uh, error due to, to the sound speed profile. Um, coupled with that, of course, uh, we have, um, well, the transducer draft is known. And in, in all of our um, data processing, we're using um, the notion of the snapback layer, uh, meaning that we perfectly know the link or we link the sound speed at the transducer head uh, with the sound speed profile. And this, this linking then, this snapback layer is also error free. So coming to the uh, sources of those sound of, of these synthetic sound speed profiles, um, well, it's um, it's been um, one of the possibilities uh, that has been uh, documented in the past is uh, that you can derive uh, sound speed profiles from uh, models, hydrodynamic models, um, and uh, we have at our disposal a, a regional hydrodynamic forecast model, which is called BSH CMOD, which is developed internally here at the BSH. Um, it predicts uh, oceanographic parameters. Uh, such as salinity and temperature. It is a, a regional model uh, limited to the North and Baltic seas. Uh, it, has a, it, it, is, it is a 48 hour forecast model. Um, it is baroclinic, meaning that it, it is uh, three dimensional. It has up to 24 depth layers. At present, it has a 900 meter uh, spatial resolution and uh, at present also a 60 minute, minute, 60 minute temporal resolution. Um, and of course, the, the idea is simple from, from, the, from the temperature, salinity information and the uh, pressure information, you can derive uh, sound speed profiles at, um, at, the, um, at, at, any, at the time, uh, at any point, at, a, at any grid point uh, in the model. And of course, this is a method that has been used in the, um, that is commonly used, uh, especially for in deep, deeper uh, water surveys. Um, and especially for transit data where there's often no time to uh, actually perform uh, a sound velocity um, cast or, or, pro or take a sound velocity profile measurement. Uh, but this is then the idea of using a, a higher resolution model uh, in a shallow environment. Um, the second source of synthetic information is uh, uh, interpolation in time and space. And this is, well, relatively simple. It's weighted mean uh, of observed sound speed profiles. Um, so using that uh, weighted mean, we can, uh, we can generate any synthetic profile at any location and at any time. Um, the interpolation method that we use um, um, weights uh, each profile according to space and time, and it also gives or attributes uh, an individual weighting function to each of the of the of the profiles. Now, in any uh, interpolation uh, method, the real challenge is not so much the implementation; it's really finding uh, or determining appropriately the weights that you uh, that you will be using. Um, and at present, this interpolation method that we're using is, is deterministic, meaning that it's um, um, we're the ones that are actually tweaking the um, weights based on a, a best assessment of the temporal and spatial variability. Um, yeah, and but there are other techniques, and I'll, I'll talk about it this uh, a little bit more in the in the outlook of this presentation. And in terms of um, analysis method, um, well, the um, the idea uh, is quite simple. In, all, in this project, uh, in order to measure any, um, in order to evaluate the, the the performance of using synthetic profiles instead of, of observed profiles, uh, we used a uh, ray tracing method. So the, the the left diagram is an illustration. Um, uh, of what I mean, uh, if you are conducting a survey and you only take one a single sound speed measurement, then you can you can ray trace uh, your sounding, of course, and 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 obtain uh, sounding solutions. Um, but it's really when you have two profiles that you're able to do things like um, um, ray trace, then using the two profiles and determine depth biases uh, and across track biases. And on the left here, you have well the, the basic idea: you're ray tracing uh, with using one profile and comparing then. Um, uh, with the ray trace solution of another profile. Um, you can, the, this is the approach that we've been using, but you can also use, and, and we've tested that a little bit, you can use a functional model, and that, that's the functional model that's uh, used, um, that uh, we've been using together with Citco. Um, uh, uh, some functional model that estimates uh, the, uh, or gives the depth uh, bias as a function of the uh, mean sound speed profile error. Um, and at the bottom, you have a plot uh, uh, of this the, of the depth bias as a function of beam angle, and it's been plotted for these 
two possible approaches, either ray tracing or, or, or the um, functional model approach. And uh, in this case, we see that there's generally a good agreement between the two solutions. Right. Um, so let's delve into some uh, example data sets. Um, uh, I've picked two um, uh, data sets uh, that were collected in uh, the summer 2020 in the Baltic Sea. Um, here we have a survey A. So on the top left, you have the survey lines and the uh, position of the sound speed profiles. At the bottom left, the actual sound speed profiles. At the top right, uh, you have the surface sound speed at the transducer head, um, and we see that it's relatively stable, uh, meaning that um, the conditions here uh, are, are very, actually, are very good, and they're um, actually atypical uh, of what we see in the Baltic Sea. So this is not what you would typically see as a stable. Um, uh, yeah, you, we um, we don't see this these stable conditions as often in in the summer day in the summer months. And the last plot here, the color plot, is, is, is just the uh, cross-section view uh, in time and space of the uh, water column. Um, so what we did with this um, survey, I'm showing you here uh, basically um, to evaluate how the um, model uh, or the synthetic profiles coming from the model, uh, um, how good they are. Uh, we compared them to uh, the um, sound speed profiles that were measured using the underway system. So on the top right, you have this comparison between the real measurements and what the model predicts at this time and space. Um, on the left plot, you have the actual of time, let's say, at which each of these um, un, uh, real measurements were taken. And in this case, we took a, um, in this particular survey day, we did a total of 139 survey, uh, uh, sorry, sound speed profile measurements. And at the bottom, the bottom plot is, that, is just um, for each of these uh, measurements, we did a, a comparison between the um, solution provided by the um, synthetic profile versus the uh, real observed data. And that red line is a, a limit that we set, uh, which is 0.25% uh, of depth. Uh, and, on, and the right plot is simply a frequency distribution of these of this depth biases. Now you see that, of course, the um, the bias exceeds what uh, with the requirement that we've set, um, um, and uh, and also that the the distribution is actually not very well uh, normally distributed. Um, but bear in mind that the highest um, bias in this case was um, about 0.4 percent of depth, and in 20 meters depth, um, then we're dealing with uh, a depth error which is about less than 10 centimeters. So it's not. Like it, it doesn't fulfill uh, the requirements we we need, but it's 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 actually not bad in a sense uh, if if the models can can be improved in the future. Um, looking at the and another example, a more a more typical uh, example data set, um, which I called here Survey B. Um, so again, we have the same pattern. We have the um, survey lines on the top left and the position of uh, this time 170 uh, sound speed uh, profile measurements. Um, they are uh, depicted here in the lower left. And in the upper right, you have the um, surface sound speed at the transducer. And you can see uh, these nice, um, uh, yeah, cur um, or hills, let's say, um, uh, throughout the survey. And these hills actually represent the back and forth motion of the, of the ship as it, as it surveys on one line and then comes back on the next line. So you see that, uh, and then it's well, you can see it well in this cross-section null plot as well in time and space that the um, that the the ship is is crossing uh, this this sound speed gradient and this is more um, something that's more typical of what we see uh, in our data sets. Um, and for, for this particular data set here, um, we decided so we used um, we tried to evaluate the performance of the interpolation. Um, and, and we did so in the following manner. So um, from the um, 170 profiles, we selected uh, eight profiles, which uh, are were fairly well um, distributed in time and space. And they are represented here in the upper left plot by these, these uh, red uh, vertical lines. They're one, the profiles that were selected and the, the slightly darker uh, than uh, black lines are the, um, are the um, are the observed, um, the measured uh, sound, the other me measured sound speed profiles that we've chosen to ignore. On the right, top right here, um, you see then in green the original sound speed profiles, and and in in blue the um, interpolated profiles from these eight uh, selected sound speed profiles. And in the lower um, 
left part, you see a diagram uh, which um, uh, overlays the depth biases either by using these um, eight uh, profiles, uh, which we would normally do if we, we wouldn't have um, uh, an underway uh, profiling system. Um, and you see in green, uh, sorry, no, not in green, but in blue this time, the um, bi depth biases um, um, using then uh, those eight um, um, some real uh, measurements, but coupled with the um, interpolated then uh, measurements. Uh, and the lower right uh, plot then is, is the frequency distribution uh, of the depth bias. And so in green, uh, the um, normal um, survey operation, let's say, using just eight profiles, and in blue then the interpolated profiles. And you see then that the uh, the depth, well, it sort of has, it has improved uh, the um, um, uh, that the depth bias is smaller. Um, of course, this this was all um, simulated ray tracing. That that means the, these these um, we simply here take the sound speed profiles and and run a simulated ray tracing to see what would be um, what would be the effect. Um, the next slide actually is the same survey, um, but this time we use the actual soundings um, solutions and we simply do sounding differences to, to evaluate uh, the, um, um, the, the process of using um, eight pro real profiles versus using the interpolated profiles. Um, the left is uh, just um, um, diagrams showing uh, per in, with the x-axis being the ping, num ping number and, and the y-axis being the beam number. Uh, and the, the depth bias is color coded. And on the right, this is simply a rear view of those same two plots, green being the solution with um, um, uh, the eight measured profiles and uh, blue being the um, uh, interpolated profiles. And what we, what we see um, is that uh, we definitely have uh, an increase in the usable uh, swath uh, when we're um, combining our uh, observed measurements with, with uh, with our um, synth with synthetically derived um, sound speed uh, profiles. Right. So to to conclude, um, we see then then with sound speed pro profiles um, generated from models, um, they're potentially usable uh, when the long term. Uh, well, under long-term stable oceanographic conditions, um, and especially if the predictions could be uh, improved in the future. Um, so there is a potential there. Um, from the point of view of interpolation, we see that under our normal oceanographic conditions, well, um, we do see uh, an, an increase in, in the um, usable swath, uh, and that's, this, 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 this is definitely an, uh, um, uh, an, um, yeah, a benefit of, of using um, interpolation. In terms of the outlooks, um, as I mentioned, um, we uh, we would like to use a higher resolution, um, both temporally and spatially um, models uh, to see if we can get better results uh, uh, with those models. And we're um, currently partnering with uh, a partner institute here in Germany um, uh, that um, has developed a, a hydrographic model of just the Baltic Sea, which is of higher resolution, uh, both temporally and spatially. It's a 200 meter resolution. And they're actually working on models that could go, even more regional models that could go up to uh, 50 centimeter resolution. Uh, sorry, 50 meter resolution, not, not centimeters. Um, uh, and one interesting also, um, Outlook that we're looking at is um, the, uh, and I mentioned it before, that um, uh, right now we're using a deterministic interpolation approach. Um, so the weights are uh, sort of empirically determined. Um, but we're, we're trying to see if we're not, we wouldn't be able to um, use uh, the model prediction themselves um, and try to look at this spatial and autocorrelation. A spatial and temporal autocorrelation to see if those models could not be used to uh, predict them more objectively um, the uh, actual weights. Um, so basically, this is using some some sort of geospatial technique uh, instead of a determinist, deterministic um, technique. And this would allow us to, to weight then uh, appropriately in space and time, depending on the uh, situation that we're uh, facing on a particular survey day. Um, and last but not least, um, uh, well, uh, one of the um, one of the things that we've noticed is that even with our with a fully uh, with a high resolution um, uh, survey, meaning that we've uh, 
we've taken as many sound speed profiles as we can with a um, an underway uh, profiling system. And um, well, we, even when we have these conditions, we still continue to see some form of refraction problems that are remaining. Um, and that even for uh, surveys under good uh, that were that were taken under good conditions. So some possible explanations for the continued presence of these refraction errors. Well, the first thing is, yeah, have we actually sampled um, have we sampled the call the the water column uh, densely enough? Um, but it's what we're thinking more is that uh, we might be dealing with uh, beam steering errors, which which uh, have haven't been accounted for. And I mentioned in the beginning that we have we assume that we don't have any errors, but now it's probably we need to investigate of if there really are um, if they if they if there could be some errors in in, in the beam steering, um, and uh, and as well if there is if there might not be also um, some errors with the this notion of the snapback layer between the sound speed at the transducer uh, head and the, the actual sound speed profiles. And that was it on my side. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any.